Well, everybody, you're welcome again. And folks at home, you're very much welcome as well. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to have an interview with uh, one of the leadership team, one of the elders here in Ballyhopper Gospel Hall, asking a few questions about his life and what has brought him to where he is. So, um, <coughs> so first of all, I'll just throw it out to the audience to ask whatever question they want. I'm only joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you look very Pass. Calm. <laughs> you look very calm about it. Now, I also have some pictures, and so we'll show those as time goes along. We could get to the, the first slide, which just shows um, um, a frame. So we have that in the background, and we'll know where we're at. So, Paul, when you were born, you were very young. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I doubt if you remember much about it. Do you know what day of the week it was? It was, uh, I think it was a Thursday going into a Friday or a Wednesday going into a Thursday. Yes, you're right. That is what it was. <laughs> and uh, it was, of course, the 11th of January 1968. And why Paul said that in that sort of... was because... Because I was apparently born at the stroke of midnight. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but um, so there you go. That's an interesting wee fact. And you were born um, in Belfast. That's right, yes. In the city hospital. Mm -hmm. there. Is that the existing city hospital? No, I think they've demolished a bit that I was born in. <laughs> it's a bit of a theme. As we'll discover. Yes, I noticed that as we're going through different places he lived, they all seem to have been demolished. <laughs> but anyway, and so you were the, the first child for your mother and father, and who were they then? Uh, my mum uh, is Lorraine, and my dad is George. Um, they had just been married um, the year before I arrived, in 1967, so I was pretty much close to being a honeymoon baby. Yeah. And then the year after that, the trouble started. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway. Yeah. And um, so that was your mother and father. Now you were the only child to Lorraine and George. That's correct, yes. And um, well, we, we may just get to the point that it wasn't a successful marriage. Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, my parents separated whenever I was roughly around about three years old. Um, Mum moved back to Belfast to Annadale Flats, which is where I lived my formative years, um, just around the corner from my grandparents on my mum's side, and just overlooking the um, what's now a TA barracks um, mm. in Annadale. It was my bedroom window overlooked the car park there, so um, Friday and Saturday nights didn't get much sleep, but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, uh, so you started off in Lisburn? Yes, I did. And moved then to the Annadale Flats? That's correct, yes. Uh -huh. mm. Okay, so... Um, and then that's where you sort of had formative years growing up in around that area, yes? Yes, that's right. Uh, so you went to school there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to uh, Rosetta Primary School. Um, very much influenced, I think, by my grandfather, um, uh, Alan Douglas was his name. Uh, he was my grandmother's husband. Now, I have to explain this, okay, but he um, wasn't um, my grandfather by blood as it were okay it wasn't your um, mum's dad yes my mum's dad had uh, died when my mum was 15 back in the 50s and as it happened um my granda who i knew as my granda alan his wife had also died um sort of quite young so um they had come together sort of later in life and uh you know got landed with the turmoil that was me <laughs> um, but they had a my granda douglas he had a, an elder son I had a son of his own called Colin, he had went to Rosetta and so it was sort of passed on, that's where I should go. And you were saying Rosetta, that's off Sunnyside Street there which leads? Well, it's sort of at the top of the apex of the Ormo and Ravenhill Roads, um, Yeah, just up, up there. So, right. yeah. so then um, you, lived, you lived there in that the Annadale Flats until you finished primary. That's right. Uh -huh. And then we have another move. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, then I moved to Bangor now city of Bangor, believe it or not. Um, and we moved down to a house called 37 Dorothy Avenue in Bangor. Um, my mum by this stage had remarried again um, to uh, a guy called Frank Ford, who uh, my stepfather now, and they're still living in Bangor now. Um, and a couple of years after they were married in 1979, and then a year or two later, my young brother, David, was born mm -hmm. to that uh, union. 
Yeah, so what's the age difference between you and... 12 years. I think I had David, is it? Yes, uh -huh. David, yes, 12 years. I had to count it out the last time I was talking to you, but yeah, it was 12 years. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's a fair gap now. It is, yeah. it is, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, and um, you went to school, of course, in Bangor. You'd left the primary school in Belfast. Now you're going to a secondary school, mm -hmm. which is... Which is Grantia Boys High School. They haven't knocked it down, have they? They haven't knocked it down, um, but um, it's not there anymore. The, the <laughs> Bangor Grammar moved into it now, so that's where Bangor Grammar now is. Um, you were almost a grammar school boy then? Well, I was. I mean, I, I, arguably, I mean, I did actually pass my 11 plus, but I think with the move and everything else, something got mixed up and I ended up going there. But I got your place. I was satisfied actually because the grammar didn't play football and secondary school did. Uh, so that was, that was at me. Just, just a wee bit. Okay, I think we might come to that. Okay, so you went to Grantia and, um, and then uh, whenever you were in Belfast, of course, and it's sort of important that we bring this in, um, your, your grandfather, Douglas, was quite an influence in your life. Yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. he was certainly uh, one of those men who, he would have introduced me to football. Um, he was, took me over to Windsor Park to watch Linfield. He, he also um, suggested, right, I should join the BB. So I joined at the age of roughly about eight. I was sent along to um, Cook Centenary Church on the Ormer Road, where the um, eighth company of the Belfast Battalion met there. And that's where I started my, my boys' brigade mm -hmm. journey. Um, so yeah, Grandad would have been very influenced. One of those men who, and I think there's several people along life's journey, you know, one of these people who you just didn't want to disappoint. Yeah. You know, it's not that you were afraid of them, but you know, it was a case of if ever I was, you know, acting up, mum would say, I'll tell your grand about that. And oh, no, don't do that, don't do that. Not because I was afraid of them, because you just didn't want to, to disappoint them. Yes, you know? uh -huh. that's a good one. Let's look at a couple of photographs. We have some here that we want to show, so let's see, click. Um, Okay, let's look at some of the early years then of Paul Whiteside. There he is. <laughs> You're doing lovely. Yes, yeah, setting up on all my own. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very clever. And there you are. At first I thought, oh, there's the start of football because I didn't have my glasses on, but it's not a football, is it? Yes, it no, is my favourite teddy bear. It's your favourite teddy bear. <laughs> what, sorry, where's that photograph taken now? Now that is taken on Timby Park. Now if you were to turn the camera around and face up the road, you'd be the entrance gates to the TA camp oh, right, is at right. the top of that road, so that's uh -huh. my granny grandma's front right. garden. There you are. And there you are, the young smiling boy at yes. primary school. That's right. Uh, primary school is okay, yeah. I, I love primary school. You love primary school. School is best days of your lives, kids. <laughs> Honestly, it is. Enjoy it while you're there, it really is. And uh, let's move on, we'll look a couple more pictures. There you are now, I'm, I'm thinking you're a teenager now. Yes, uh -huh. that was Starting probably... Starting to look like yourself. Yes, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> Still smiling. <laughs> so that's some of your, your early photographs then of you as a young boy. Mm -hmm. And you were telling me, we, Paul and I had a chat, you know, before we quizzed him, and you were telling me you had sort of varied religious influences. Mm -hmm. And maybe you want to explain that. Yeah, well, I was sort of saying about uh, mum and dad and them had separated, but they were both we were married in Great Victoria Street Baptist Church. So they were both believers, mm. which I found out in later years, you know, but um, so I suppose in one way it's, it's a bit of a warning there, you know, it's, you have to work at these things and you have to keep God at the centre of yeah. everything you do in your marriage. And it's that so important. Um, but on my, my dad's side, um, my grandparents, they went to the Baptist Church. On my mum's side, um, my granddad Douglas and granny, they would have went to St Mary Magdalene Church, which was Church of Ireland on the um, Donegal Pass. And then, of course, with the Boys Brigade influence, and Cook Centenary was Presbyterian, so, you know, when I went to Ballyhome Presbyterian, when I moved down and joined the BB down there as well. So, really, it's a bit of a Heinz 57 variety, so, you know, coming from everywhere, and as you know, Living in this country, you can hardly, you know, walk down the street without tripping over several churches, you know. So, and I, my generation, I suppose, that was still something that was, maybe was beginning to be on the way in, but it was still very much of the fore. You know, yeah. the church had a, a big influence on, on society. You know? Yeah. So you moved to, to Bangor, to Dorothy Avenue, and you were sent, but not accompanied, 
Yes. To which church was that? Ballyholm Presbyterian. Ballyholm Presbyterian. Mm -hmm. Well, that's sort of interesting. If Paul told me that you were you were sent, um, usually you're brought to church, uh, but your mother sent you, but yeah. didn't really herself attend. Well, as the aspect was, Mum was a midwife, um, and her working time really was weekends. So she worked Friday night, Saturday night, maybe Sunday night. So obviously Sunday mornings wasn't really an option for her because she was sleeping, you know. So it really fell to my stepdad who it was a case of he would have gone I don't know what he went and did, played golf, went for a drive or whatever, but I was sent to church. So and as you can imagine that can become yeah. a bit of resentment as you grow into a teenager, you know. But yeah. But you joined the BB in there? Yes, yes, I joined the BB there, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so yep, yeah. and that was um, seventh banger that I joined there. I was okay. in the senior section there for a few years. So well, you're starting to get a bit of a thing that the BB has quite an influence on young Paul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, certainly really enjoyed the junior section whenever I was in Belfast. Um, there was a couple of brothers, uh, McWilliams brothers, um, the elder brother, he was captain of the senior section, and the younger brother, Ernest, he was captain of the, the junior section. Um, again, one of those figures, you just didn't want to disappoint. Lovely man, mm -hmm. lovely man. Um, and I sort of, uh, I remember my first night actually in Belfast at the BB, and I think there must have been somebody with a similar name to me, and I think it was, you know, David White or something like that there, and they were handing out badges at the end of the the day and I think it was a white badge that he'd, he'd got and I thought this is easy I was getting I was all halfway up to get my badge and realized that wasn't my name it was called you know but um, I did my badge work as you do um, and I think I had my badge work finished early I had my badge work finished by the end of P6 uh, and I was given the choice of oh, well you can go up to the senior section or um, you can stay in the junior section with all my friends were there I sort of wanted to stay so when all my friends went to do their badge work on BB night, um, I got to sit with uh, the captain and play drafts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while, while you're in Bangor then, you're going to BB, you're occasionally attending church, or mm -hmm. sent to church? Sent to church for it, yeah. Now, I was, I was just curious to ask you at that time, what a young lad, and entering into his teens and so on, what your take on, on God was at that time? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you sort of talked about having a respect, but... Yeah, I think that was sort of instilled probably in most people of that generation. Um, but yeah, my granda, again, um, and I don't know that he ever made a profession as being a Christian, you know, but it's one of those people you look, he always gave me good advice. He always was looking out for me and, you know, was doing right by me. You know, I, I, I just I would pray that he has, mm -hmm. he has got that himself. Um, but because I think a lot of the churches at that time, it wasn't, I think they broadly agreed on the salvation, yes. you know, as opposed to being completely different and trying to have an identity of their own, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah, my granddad would, you know, when I was a younger fellow, for an example, you know, if we were out playing football, it would be, of course, you know, if you, you take the ball out under your arm on a Sunday, it would be a case of you're hardly going to kick football on a Sunday, are you? That sort of, yeah. you know, respect, you know, so I always had that respect for God, knew that God was there and something that you didn't, or who you didn't want to really mess with. Mm -hmm. You know, you wanted to try and do right by, if you like. Yes, I understand, yeah. So you did your, your O-levels then at Grancha, but then you moved on to Bangor Tech, where you, right. you, you did some work with the YTP, the youth training program. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as by default, nearly you took up an engineering. Yes, uh -huh. uh, which you weren't overly interested in. No, no. Again, <laughs> this is where um, I'm probably coming from the generation your grandparents come from. Um, it's a case of look, be you left school on Friday and somebody had a job lined up for you on the on the Monday, and that's just the way things were. Um, so if you didn't have an idea what you really wanted to do with your life, well, somebody was going to push you in a certain direction of what I suppose what they knew. My granddad would have worked in shorts for many years, you know, not literally, you know, but <laughs> the aircraft factory. Um, so there was a feeling that, well, maybe that's this is somewhere you can maybe want to go, but it wasn't really, really what I wanted. No. Now, before I move on to your first job, I might point out at this time that you did meet um, a Philip Montgomery. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in what respect did you meet her in the tech? Well, after I spent um, an industrious year in uh, the YTP, finding out exactly what he didn't want to do with my life, um, I went back to um, tech um, the following year to do a couple of more O levels. So um, it just so happened that Philippa was in two or three of the classes that I was in. You know, obviously, I was very impressed with my my studiousness and you know all of that there sort of stuff. You know, not, but uh, yeah. So while we were there, I think actually my now wife she actually went out with a friend of mine. All right. Okay, so there was no there was no romantic spark at that stage. Yeah. You know, so uh, mm -hmm. that came at a later date. Yeah, which was, and we'll come to that shortly. So um, then you um, went on to your first job which was um, in Hills Engineering on the uh, Hollywood Road and mm -hmm. the old Hollywood Road was it? And Hollywood Road and Hollywood Belfast. Hollywood Road and yeah. Belfast. Interesting, I was thinking about this today, that they used, not only did they do Mazda dealership, they mm -hmm. also did Evan Road. That's right. And I remember Derek Reid and I owned a boat between us with an Evan Road engine and I was in Hills a number of times getting bits for it. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But I met you. Yes. Mm -hmm. You never know. Were you the guy? were not the guy who was sweeping up outside the football? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> because okay. it, it wasn't that you really got into engineering. It. No, I think that the the old um, engineering horse was being given its final flog that year. Okay. You know, I'm going to do that um, again because a friend of my grandfather's, um, his son actually worked in there, and actually, funnily enough his area of expertise as well as being a car engineer was working on boat engines mm -hmm. so his name is Ken so I went there for um, about about a year yeah about mm -hmm. a year. Mm -hmm. but you moved on and um, as you moved on then um, you had applied for a couple of jobs really mm -hmm. um, you're still not a Christian at this point no um, respectful of God You've been brought through the BB, you've heard things, but God's sort of distant. Um, so anyway, you, you, uh, your mother had two stipulations about whatever job mm -hmm. you applied for. Yes. Yes, uh, which yeah. were? Well, well, stipulations were, two stipulations in life was, yeah. number one, you're never buying a motorbike, <laughs> and number two, you're never joining the army. <laughs> right. And that's it. Okay, so those are two, and you almost held them because... Well, you did, of course, because you applied for two jobs, uh -huh. which were... Yes, um, I had applied for the civil service, and I applied for the RAF. So I was uh, on the RAF, um, I was being encouraged towards not joining the um, RAF regiment, which was effectively the army, only in RAF colours. So I had to get, do something slightly different, so I was going to do, uh, I think it was called Assistant Air Traffic Controller. You know, which is the guy with the, the paddles. <laughs> <laughs> you know that sort of thing. Um, so that was that. That was would have been that. So I went through the whole process, interviews, etc. And um, my application form or my vetting forms had been sent across to London to, you know, to finalise the deal, as it were. Um, and about a year before that, I had. Um, had it done an interview or made an application to the civil service and, then, and it was dead in the water as far as I knew um, and then the RAF letter sort of came back and said well this is what's happening with you but you know in the meantime if you do get offered any other employment don't turn it down because there's no guarantee that we're going to come back and say yes so while that happened um, I got a letter from the civil service to say would you like uh, to come for an interview oh, oh right okay so so I said yes and had the interview and asked them, well, how long is it going to be before I know anything? And they said, oh, it'll probably be, you know, two or three weeks. So I was sitting waiting on somebody coming back to me. Um, and the civil service came back to me the week before the RAF. Right. And I sort of really wanted to stay here. Yeah. So I thought, you know what, uh -huh. that's it. I don't think the recruiting sergeant was very pleased, but he said it. I, <laughs> I you know, took your advice and here we are. So. So you went on to the Department of Education, you worked with pensions and so on, you went to Netherly, you were with the Department uh, of Enterprise, Trade and Transport, mm -hmm. um, involved actually in the planning or pre-planning for the new Causeway Centre, would mm -hmm. that be right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you saw some all sorts of plans come in for that? 
Yes, and I was part of the team that sort of brought all of the all of the entries, as it were. Yeah. Um, and then there was a panel of experts, and all the entries yeah. would be wheeled in and looked at and criticised, and um, you know that there sort of stuff. So that was interesting. So. But during this time, then, um, of course, you there was a, a hatched plan, let us say, by a couple of your friends mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, who. Well, you tell us. Okay. Well, this is why I was still in Bangor. Um, I was in uh, the personnel department at the time. Yeah. And um, a girl called Ruth Palmer, who is, you may know um, or as Ruth Ewing now, who would have been very friendly with Philippa. Uh, and another guy I had met um, from in tech, a guy called Michael Smith, who's from Ballygilgut in Port of Ferry. Um, he was working down in education at the time. and. Uh, they come up with some sort of plan to say that, oh, uh, I remember Philippa, you know, she was uh, on the phone looking for you, you know. I think <laughs> Philippa was told the same thing and, of course, we, oh, all right, okay, it's a bit strange and ended up uh, ringing. I think I ended up ringing Philippa and ended up meeting and, uh, well, the rest is history. <laughs> Let's look at a couple more pictures at that point then. Let's see where we go from here. So... Football. Now we didn't mention this. We'll come to family there, but we'll mention some of the football because I do believe football. I always smile because every time Paul comes to share something, there's always an illustration <laughs> from football. And um, so these are some magazines, are they? That yes, magazines and programs. So just have we got a Liverpool, who would be my my go-to team. Yes. And then Linfield down in the bottom left, who would have been where my granda would have taken me, and that's where I would have yeah. went over here. Rangers, who have sort of you know you sort of follow by default over here sometimes, you know. Yes. But and then Northern Ireland, of course, hence the Spain '82 uh -huh. and the the official tournament for the 2016 <coughs> European Championships. Well, let's look at some uh, teams here. Can anybody spot the man himself? What do you mean he hasn't changed one bit? <laughs> Is that you at the bottom right? Bottom right, yes. That's yes. me at the bottom right. Bottom yeah. right. So that's you. And what age are you there then? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I would think I was probably around about 25, 26 would it be? And what team is that? Now that's actually, um, that is actually my work team in Netherly, that was Department, right, of, so Department of Economic right. Development. You also played plays. for, of course, an amateur team. Yeah, played for Castle United and Castle Bangor. And Bangor, yeah. Which I don't and have any photographs of. And for the BB, yes. Uh, uh, which was um, great, you know. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed that. One of my fondest memories, as I was sharing with you, was um, I'd actually moved um, um, companies in Bangor um, because our leadership and, and Ballyholm were always promising. We were getting to the age when we were sort of really into our football and we were about 16, 15, 16, 17. I wanted a team, senior team started and we were getting promised and promised and it didn't happen. So um, me and my friend Peter, who was my best man here, yeah. um, we moved across to um, 8th Bangor at Lesna Breen Presbyterian Church and played in the senior team there, which was very successful um, in that um, our second year we won the league got the semi-final of the cup and were knocked out another tournament by default because we started late but um, interestingly enough the final we had to play a, a playoff to win the league against third banger who were my nemesis they were they they are at um, Hamilton Road Presbyterian so they have a really large company compared to us who could basically field a team of 11 or 12 boys yeah. so and um, two of our best players that year are right side right he broke his ankle a few weeks before that. And then the week before we played the playoff, Peter, um, he broke his leg playing um, seven aside. So we were like two of our best players um, for that. But we won it. Yeah. We won a 3 2, which was great. And on, on the way home, um, we said to um, our, the officer, Bobby, he says, Bobby, come on, come and stop in. Because Peter was on the Ulster with his leg up like this, <laughs> you know. Come and stop in. So me and a couple of fellas went in and with the cup. I'm just. <laughs> that was uh, the dead bring tears to my eyes. I have to say, but it certainly brought tears to Peter's eyes because he couldn't believe it. But anyway, yeah. so that was a lovely memory. And so, some other team. What teams that you're playing in? There? Again, similar. Uh, is similar work team because you know work yeah. likes to take photographs. Whereas you know, yeah. 
or any time stone. So I haven't changed position, by the way. Where are you? Oh, yes. Just to make uh, it easy. There's another team. <laughs> oh, yes, that's <coughs> sort of a few years. Obviously, I'm wearing a couple of coats under that shirt, but uh, <laughs> no, this is a team, a guys who, some of the guys I work with, uh, some of the guys who yeah. um, we play on Friday afternoon up at uh, play ball at Stormont, so, which you still do, yeah. which I enjoy. You enjoy football? Yes. And uh -huh. um, this, that is uh, one who I call um, Stephen Noom, <laughs> otherwise known as Stevie G. Follow that? No. no. Well, Stevie G's a very famous Liverpool oh, player, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> Liverpool player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. We'll just leave that there then. Now, of course, we talked about you had a respect for God and you had the background of BB sent along to church at times, but then you met Philippa. And this is where many of us who, who know you and Philippa. Mm -hmm. We remember you coming along here. I remember very much the first time that Philippa brought you along here, mm -hmm. which was a, a, a big thing in, on, on Philippa's part to bring along her boyfriend to this church. And you came along Sunday evenings um, to the, the, the gospel services here. And one of the things you told me, one of the little things that sort of struck you, and it seemed a small thing, but it was the way that whenever the preacher was speaking, he would ask you, he would ask the members of the church to, if you to open your Bibles mm -hmm. and turn to. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And why was that? I mean, we who are used to that, be interested in knowing why was that different to you? I suppose it was different to me in many ways because we didn't have to do it at the churches I had attended before. Mm -hmm. There would always be a Bible in the pew in front of you, so you didn't really see a lot of people bringing a Bible along or following along, and you just, the minister is the minister, and let the minister carry on. With yeah. that you know um but even though even through the bb you know which is all about the advancement of christ's kingdom and that's where i would have learned you know all the books of the bible and yeah. you know all of that get built up a lot of your knowledge you know, went along to sunday school and you know all that there so you were getting all about you know and all about with the bible and the stories in the bible about jesus about you know so the bible wasn't unfamiliar to me yes okay um, but life being life, um, probably when I was 17, 18, sort of, my life was very much football driven and friends driven and, yeah. you know, down to the pub on a Saturday night sort of thing. Until I get started to, you know, put the brakes on the pub bit of it and sort of started to question where I was going with my life. Um, and I had mentioned to you about um, the outreach with Billy Graham. Yes. That uh, I think was probably possibly around around 1989 somewhere i think it was before we had got together um but i'd went along to bangor and, and you went on your own volition yes yes wasn't uh, somebody dragged no or brought you or no. invited you well i think somebody invited me yeah. but you know now i know who it was <laughs> oh, right. you know but um yeah so um and he was uh, transmitting i think it was from earl's court or hampton court or somewhere in london and it was transmitting the service throughout leisure centres and um, public buildings across the United Kingdom and the Republic, I think, as well. So I went along to to hear this, and I, I remember the first night I went, I had this. It was nearly like I was glued to my seat at the end of it, you know, and felt a very big, you know, like somebody was burdening, you know, upon me. So that was probably the first. I'd sort of, from my own point of view, you know, was really thinking, right, okay. I might I like to explore this a little more and brought my younger brother David down a couple of I think the following week or a week or two afterwards to it and um, but I didn't make any commitment then but I think that's mm -hmm. uh, I think I've said to you there that um, the way things were I think God if you are looking God knows and he will not leave you disappointed he will help yeah. you to get to where he wants you to be yeah like in Jeremiah the Bible says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, mm -hmm. declares the Lord. And I think in a sense, that's what you're saying. Yes, you had, yeah. You'd made it a movement. Now, I say you made a movement. God was calling you. Mm -hmm. But in that call, you went to hear, you heard the gospel, and now you feel the burden mm -hmm. and the draw of, mm -hmm. of what you now knew to be the Holy Spirit speaking yes. to you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
So, but you made no decision at that time, no. not at the Crusades, no. even the second night you brought your brother mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. And at the same time then, you're, you're coming, you're, you've met Philippa, um, she comes here on a, on a Friday night, comes along here on Sunday evening, brings you with her. And do you, do you remember hearing the Gospel even here? Or? Yes, yes, uh, I remember hearing the Gospel here and it starts to become more familiar to you. Um, and there's a building up of this here. This is not what I believed in the younger life, or you know, that knew that Jesus Christ had went to the cross and died for the sins of the world. And sort of pause, sins of the world. That's great. So that covers everybody. That's great. But as far as it being personal, mm. I hadn't reached that point any time in my life. And this is what I believe was beginning to happen. You yeah. know, that calling was happening. There was. Um, Christian Union, even in Bangor, um, which I knew one of the fellows who would have played football with him, and you know, I started. There was just that interest there, and I can't remember at what stage I even started going along to the Christian Union in work. And I can't remember whether that's before or after it was saved, but you know, certainly in and around that time, you know. Yeah. And then, as things happened, um, you know, the introduction or the reintroduction uh, to Philippa yeah. happened um, in October. Of 1989, she looks at me. Anyway, yes, it was <laughs> October 1989. So, Philippa herself, you know, she would have comes from a Christian home, yes, um, and would have been saved as a quite a young girl. Um, so therefore, there's me coming from this direction of seeking. You know, she would probably admit, and from her perspective, she probably wasn't where she should have been with the Lord. Yes, and you know, well, you know, the Lord brings us together. Yes. Um, and I think it would have been that following summer around 1990 that I remember going home. I can't remember the date, the date. I can't remember who was speaking, um, but I do remember going home that night and just kneeling down beside my bed and asking the Lord Jesus to save me. Yes. And I said to you, I just remember having a feeling of a burden just been lifted off me. It was like a burden rolling off my back, okay, and I have this wee book here with me tonight, uh -huh. um, and I'm not sure I've ever had actually read that beforehand, but it, it's very similar in the experience that Christian has in Pilgrim's Progress when he comes to the cross, and the burden that he's been trying to get rid of, you know, falls off his back and disappears into the to the to the grave below the cross, yeah. never to be seen again. So that was my experience. So that that was that was the night I became officially. An actual child of God, a Christian, personally, yes. coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, I, I remember uh, folks praying for you here, and then being delighted when we heard you share with us that you had mm -hmm. found salvation. That was very. It was very soon after you were sort of around here. Mm -hmm. I seem to remember. Is that be right? Yeah. Very, uh -huh. Yeah. Very soon. And um, so. Um, up to this point, actually, there's a wee funny bit that I remember you shared. Like just before you, you, you were intra the, the, the time whenever you said that explained it to me, you were hooked, like the Holy Spirit had sort of hooked and was slowly reeling you in, in mm -hmm. a sense. But um, at that point, at the back of your own church in Bally Home, you started to, whenever the minister was preaching, you would mm -hmm. get the Bible out because you sat at the back of the church and you'd start now to read the Bible along with the minister, mm -hmm. which elicited a bit of interest. Yes, uh -huh. um, like I say, before then you would just listen to the minister, but then because of my experiences down here, you know, I have to follow this in the Bible because, you know, he might be telling me nonsense, but, um, but there, there was at that stage in the, in the, in the pew behind me two elderly um, women, and, and they've obviously been following, you know, the fact that, oh, here's a young man come to church, that's really good, you know, <laughs> as you do. Uh, and then one morning I was getting up, you know, having followed the, the sermon in the Bible and they sort of leaned over behind me and touched my shoulder and says, son, are you studying to be a minister? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, hey, you know, why, you know, and then I realised, just, is this just because I'm, I'm just following, I had the Bible and is this, is this uh, what, you know, but yeah, so I thought that was, I was quite amusing and quite, you know, thinking, really, you know, that's. Uh, but yet, I mean, you were drawn to the word of God yes, and then uh -huh. I guess you're reading it and then God saved you in your wee box room. In the wee box room. Mm -hmm. Rolled away. I haven't knocked that house down, by the way. It's still there. What? Is that still yeah. there? Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a couple more pictures. 
So this is uh, family and a lead up to marriage because um, shortly after this, somebody on the top of the CN Tower in Toronto asked somebody else to marry them. Would that be right? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's very romantic. <laughs> Down on bended knee. Oh. Response was, get up, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> <laughs> and she was glued to the wall. Philip doesn't have a head for heights, but didn't really realise, you know, she was glued to the wall. So, yes, yes. <laughs> so anyway. So family and marriage. Now, this is Philip's side. Yes, um, that's Johnny and Edna. Johnny and Edna, who mm -hmm. many of us know. Yes. Uh -huh. And they're very free, and old now, but uh, yes. <coughs> and then on your wedding day, uh -huh. a marvellous photograph. On your wedding day, um, Who's the young man beside Philip over there? To, to the right? Or With the Beatles yeah. haircut, that one. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, who's either says that to your stepfather and your Yeah, I'll be your stepfather, Frank, to, um, to the my right of Philip uh -huh. and my mum on the left, and that's young David. Young David, who, who looks shorter than you because of the yes, he is. that's why I put that picture in there, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there he is, Paul and his younger, shorter brother. Yes. And there's the shorter brother whose legs are sticking way out your footer. Yes, uh, <laughs> he's now six foot seven, so it's quite amusing when I ever introduced him as, do you want to meet my wee brother? <laughs> yeah, uh, with your mum. And who are these two then? That is David and Frank. That yeah, was, uh, so he's a tall man, is your brother? Yes. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. um, and then, we just want to look at your family because you were married then mm -hmm. and uh, in 19... First of August, 1992. 92. My developer. And the story goes on. And of course, <laughs> then soon a little family comes. And that's you at the far end there with who? That will be um, our Victoria, I believe. <coughs> yeah. There's a bunch of us and our wives and our children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom managed to get in a woman's photograph. <laughs> <laughs> the wonder he didn't get the ladies day, I'm telling you. I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> And, and here's, here's, the, here's the children. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was one of our first trips to Disneyland in Florida. Looks and exciting. you're looking at it and going, <laughs> I'm glad I spent all this money. <laughs> yeah. And there's your lovely girls. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yes. A few years ago. And there's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> like, you haven't brought them up very well. So <laughs> and uh, there you are again, the whole family, uh -huh. and all the girls. And... Uh, can't imagine what it would be like living in a house of four girls, but anyway. <laughs> and there's our Rachel. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. and, uh, and as I mentioned, the BB was, was important in your life. Well, praise God for organisations like this, uh -huh. too, who, who uh, and many good BBs, and uh, who, who preach the gospel and, and share the word of God with the boys, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. give that background, which helped you come to faith, too, and having that. Yeah, and I saw that the idea of, you know, Mm -hmm. We've been singing about the anchor. Um, yes. You know, it's the sure and steadfast. Yes. You know, it's something that when you realise when you get it, it is sure and steadfast, and you're putting your faith in something that is real, and it's never going to let you down. You know. So. Just finish a couple of photographs here before we. I'm going to, well, maybe go five minutes, work, but not much more than that. So just some interesting little things. You do have some influential friends. Yes, uh, see. see the resemblance? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know how you meet these people. <laughs> uh, and the girls, of course, too. They, you know, so, and you and I noticed that I was in your house, I noticed you have an interest in, in aircraft yes. and all things RAF. So it hasn't left you no, no. at all. Yeah. And that, uh, I was going to suggest that the reason I really didn't join the RAF is because they, haven't, they weren't flying Spitfires anymore. All right. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so, and here, I, I just thought, what? Is that that Paul's wearing? Funny looking shorts. Anyway, <laughs> right. and uh, and there we go. The Grand Canyon, I think. Possibly. Yes, that's, that's right. What I thought. The mm -hmm. lovely photograph of the girls. And uh, maybe paddling down it. Yes, it was. Uh, I was near. I'm not sure whether it's Arizona or California somewhere, but yes, yeah, that was yeah. that was fun. And there's our Victoria with a harness on her because she is going to jump out of an aircraft, uh -huh, okay. which she did. Uh -huh. And not to be outdone, so did you. Yes. <laughs> and I have to say, looking at that photograph, where is the parachute? <laughs> <That's a terrifying>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll give that a miss. And interestingly, too, you've been to. Israel. Israel. Uh, this that, is Jerusalem. That's actually Joppa or Jaffa. Joppa. Jaffa, Jaffa, Jaffa. Right. Yes, uh -huh. we're saving the Tanner's house. So, so, so 
having trusted in Jesus, you have also visited the place where he actually walked. Yes. And where's that then? That is in Magdala, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's the two of you looking at something. Yes, something. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what, but anyway, don't know what. it's just okay, one of those. <laughs> That's quite amazing. Uh -huh. But you brought this back from Israel. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Which just reminds you that we have been engrafted into the family of God. That's right. Uh -huh. Isn't that right? Uh -huh. yeah. And that's marvellous. So, um, uh, maybe just at this point, you'd just like to share just a favourite scripture that you pass on to the audience here and an audience at home. Mm -hmm. Something that, where God has spoken to you, uh, and then we're going to just finish in our last couple yeah. of minutes. Well, it probably comes as no surprise. You know, I like things simple. Okay, I like to play my football simply. I like to, things to be simple and straightforward, and I don't think the gospel it should be any different, really. Um, so when I mention John 3 and 16, which as we all know is, has been referred to often as the gospel in, in a nutshell, um, which says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I think this is the, the bridging verse for me, is of going from believing in a God who died for the sins of the world to believing in a Saviour who died for my sins. Because of that, you know, this, this whoever or the whosoever in there, you know, so often you hear about, you know, if you just stick your name in there, you know, that's the reality, you know. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that... Paul Whiteside, or put your name in there if you should choose, you know, believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I have found that to be true ever since I have put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, And that would be your recommendation, I know, too, for the folks who are watching at home. So at this point, thank you for listening, just to uh, a little bit of background of Paul's life and how he came to trust in Jesus Christ. who called him, saved him, and has promised eternal life with him. Thank you folks for joining at home.